All right, people, like you heard, today it's all about hydrogen. But before we jump into today's article, let's talk about today's sponsor, Mauser Electronics. Now, by now you should know that Mauser is one of the world's biggest electronic suppliers, which means that they have great connections with both academia and industry, so they know a lot of cool things coming down the pipeline. And sometimes they write about it. They actually wrote an entire article about the future of the automotive world. They talk about connected cars. But more importantly, at least as it relates to this article, they talk about how future cars are going to be powered. You know, right now we're seeing battery-powered vehicles, electric is the future. But then they dive into hydrogen fuel cells. They talk about how the size of batteries make it so for larger applications, for example, semi-trucks. Mm -hmm. It might be a lot more feasible to use hydrogen, but then they talk about the drawbacks with hydrogen, how storing it and distributing it is a pain. I don't know. It's just a good primer in terms of like the current state of the automotive world and what the future looks like, its limitations and the things that we should be working towards. Super relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. And yeah, I just enjoyed reading it. I think you might too. If you're interested, as always, you can find them in the show notes. That's what I was going to say. It's an awesome primer on what we're talking about today because mm -hmm. today we're concerned a lot about the considerations of when you can and should use hydrogen and when the current constraints with hydrogen like storage like distribution like production etc are, are make it really challenging to use hydrogen and in, in today's ecosystem let's yeah. say so they do a good job of laying out where hydrogen is really really effective and where it's not effective yet and some of the not effective yet parts can be addressed by what we're talking about today um, which is some research from EPFL, which focuses on getting high, the, the title is getting, getting hydrogen out of ammonia. But I think a more descriptive way of saying it would be using hydrogen for what it's best at and using ammonia for what it's, it's, be, what it's best at and using a, a really interesting way to convert between hydrogen and ammonia so you can take, you know, basically get the best of both worlds. Absolutely. So let's let's take a step back real quick. We talked about the issues with hydrogen when talking about the Mauser article. So what are those issues? Now we've we actually have hydrogen fuel cells like products from manufacturers like Toyota available right mm -hmm. now, right? But they're not doing well. I think Toyota stopped manufacturing that model. They were um, refueling stations for hydrogen powered cars in California, the only ones in the United States, I believe, they're closing down as well. The big problem here is that for the state that hydrogen is most useful is in its liquid form. Mm -hmm. And in the liquid form, A, you have loss of hydrogen over time in whatever container you put it. So you have to have really good engineering and it has to be very cold. I think minus 273. Minus 252 Celsius. 252 Celsius. Very, very cold. So you, that requires a lot of energy just to keep it at that temperature. And not. it's not easy to um, have the facilities that can operate at that temperature. And then, of course, you have the fact that it's explosive. So uh, transporting it, storing it is always going to be a pain. And that's one of the big reasons why it hasn't taken off, you know, in a large scale, despite being so promising because hydrogen is so abundant. It's literally everywhere. And if you use it as a fuel source, its byproduct is the most clean byproduct you could freaking ask yeah, for. It, it's water. It's water. So I, I think truly part of what makes hydrogen so awesome mm -hmm. for storing energy, um, the fact that it's got such high energy density and the molecule size is very, very small, is also what makes it really, really challenging to transport really, really challenging to store. Like you mentioned, um, if you want to store it as a liquid, it's got to be at minus 253 Celsius, which yep. is an insanely low temperature to try and maintain on a regular basis. It ends up, you end up spending a lot of a energy, energy trying to keep something that cold. Um, even if you want to use it in its gas form, uh, I think you have to keep it somewhere in the order of like 350 to 700 times standard atmospheric pressure. pressure. Yeah. So it's like, that's a lot of pressure, right? There's a lot of mechanical engineering that goes into creating vessels that can handle that level of pressure. And then to try and transport gas under that pressure is mm -hmm. also probably pretty, pretty challenging. So basically part of what makes hydrogen so awesome is the fact that it's got such high energy density and it's such a small molecule. That's also the same reason that we can't transport it easily. It's also the same reason that we can't store it easily. So if we want to be able to use it, um, we have to find a more convenient way of storing hydrogen, a more convenient way of transporting hydrogen. And so far, 
the, the brute force engineering ways of doing it, high temperature or very low pressure, have turned out to be not that proof, not that fruitful. Mm-hmm. I think kind of what the next frontier is here is using chemistry to try and stabilize the hydrogen in its form, um, and and find a way that you know we can trend or transform hydrogen into another type of molecule that does much better at lower t- that does much better at higher temperatures and does much better at lower temperatures and ideally we already have infrastructure associated with transporting and storing it and that's kind of what this research is focused on is using hydrogen in the form of ammonia which i think is nh3 minus correct um so you have one hydrogen, three hydrogen. And, and it stabilizes this hydrogen situation mm-hmm. to a point where you can transport it at nearly standard atmospheric pressure and you can keep it at standard or nearly standard atmospheric temperature. Um, and fortunately enough, we've also got in, in many places a lot of infrastructure associated with transporting and storing hydrogen or storing ammonia where hydrogen is lacking. So the, the idea here is can we use the chemical advantages of ammonia that has a lot of hydrogen as a part of it? Um, use that as a way of kind of creating a hydrogen battery, so to speak. Storing hydrogen as ammonia, using that as a way to transport the energy, and then when you want to, you want to discharge the energy that's in hi- in hydrogen, you somehow convert ammonia back into hydrogen. Correct. Um, in a way that, at least so far to date, has, has proven to be pretty inefficient. This research team is focusing on finding a more efficient way to do that. Yeah. And w- one thing I want to point out um, as a part of doing research for this episode, I came across an article from UPenn making the claim of why ammonia should be more focused on for, um, you know, clean energy sources. And they had a pretty nifty little chart that I want to share. This is a comparison of energy in kilowatt hours per unit volume liters across batteries, hydrogen and ammonia. Mm-hmm. So they, they point out lithium ion batteries, which is the most commonly used form of um, energy storage for electricity, yep. for electric vehicles, um, even backup power to houses, um, you're looking at 0.45 megawatt hours per meter cubed. Then they go to liquefied hydrogen, which is what we, you and I have been talking about. Mm-hmm. And you're looking at 2.3 megawatt hours per meter cubed. So already, you know, significantly better. Um, What's that? F- five, five to six times better? Pretty much. Then they have a couple of other numbers for not liquefied hydrogen, gas hydrogen at different temperatures and pressures, basically showing, you know, it's it's lower than liquefied hydrogen. That I'm not going to say that. But liquid ammonia is at 3.58 megawatt hours per meter cubed. Crazy. So you have an even higher energy potential with the ammonia than you do with the liquid, uh, liquefied hydrogen. However, like you mentioned... The trick there is actually unlocking that hydrogen from the ammonia. Now, how do, how do you do that? Well, there is the typical conventional approach, um, which is heat heating it. Mm-hmm. You have to heat it up to 900 degrees Celsius to get the um, hydrogen atoms to separate from the nitrogen, which kind of similar to cooling. Um, you end up spending a lot of energy <laughs> trying to unlock this energy. So at that point, it, the math doesn't really math the way you would want it to. Well, if you had a free unlimited 900, did you say 900 Celsius? Yeah. If you had an unlimited free 900 Celsius heat source that you had abundant use of, you should probably just put water on it and use it for geothermal energy instead of <laughs> using it as a way of splitting ammonia into hydrogen. Correct. Correct. But um, the other form is what they refer to as uh, cracking ammonia they use some sort of catalyst to get these to split. Now, one of the ones that they mentioned was uh, Ruth- nickel. I, I was going to say ruthenium. I didn't, I didn't know about that one. But it, essentially, it's a lot of like these processes tend to use rare earth materials, which tend to be, as the name implies, rare, um, which is the same, one of the big problems we have with lithium ion batteries, but also costly. So you might be able to get them to split, but the cost associated with them and if you can do it at scale that's kind of questionable so that's that's another shortcoming another positive that i think is worth noting out before we move on is um i i had mentioned that you when you have liquefied hydrogen you lose an x amount of it over time yeah that rate is significantly lower with ammonia they again shout out to the folks at upenn they did a study over 360 days of storing liquefied hydrogen and comparing um, the original 
amount versus what was left at the end. I believe with the uh, liquefied hydrogen, they hit um, zero by 300 in within one year. And on the ammonia, they had lost maybe five to 10%. Yeah. So over a year, you may lose five to 10% of the total ammonia that Mm -hmm. you had stored when it's in a liquid form. But if you compare that to hydrogen, within a year, you lose all of the liquid hydrogen you stored. So, uh, and that's despite best efforts to keep it cool in a good container, et cetera, et cetera. Think about you fill your tank with some hydrogen, right, for your car. Um, And imagine, you know, just a couple of days later. Your tank's already at three quarters. And a couple of days later after that, your tank's already at half. And you haven't even driven your car. Yeah. Your money's literally disappearing into the air. Um, liquid ammonia still does that, but to a much lesser extent, right? 5% losses over the extent of an yeah. entire year, um, which is, I'm guessing, it may even be less volatile than gas. I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure about that, but I, I've definitely put gasoline in a gas tank before and come back a year later and I think it was empty. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean... Mentally, that makes sense to me. We got to fact check ourselves later, <laughs> though. Um, but with that said, let's, I think, start talking about what's going on here at EPFL, right? So the, this, uh, this PhD researcher came to EPFL because of this problem. They were inspired by the potential that hydrogen has. They were driven by trying to make it, again, scalable, widely available, And then they saw potential here within the catalyst to really make ammonia the deliverable method of making this energy used worldwide. So this is is the part that's a little disappointing. We don't actually have the sauce because they didn't tell us the sauce. Yeah. They're keeping the sauce under wraps. Probably for good reason. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are after this, um, but they file for a patent. But from what we know, they have come up with a new catalyst that uses abundant raw materials and it cuts the cost of, you know, the state of the art catalyst for, for, from cracking, right? From using yes, the cracking, cracking method, not the heating approach, the cracking approach by 200 times. I mean, I don't want to say it sounds too good to be true. I hope it's true. I hope it's true. And I, I want th- I think, it to be true. I think that's why we feel like it's worth covering here. Right? Exactly. We, we don't want to, help perpetuate snake oil salesmen here. Absolutely. We truly think from a fundamental perspective, the engineering checks out. I'm hoping that they've found the correct catalyst here. In this case, that is truly 200 times cheaper. Um, I I looked up ruthenium, like I said, is one of the leading rare earth metals that they use to help crack um, the nitrogen from the hydrogen. And it costs like just less than half of what gold costs per ounce. So I'm like, pocket change. It, it's like almost worth its weight in gold. Um, if you can do it 200 times cheaper than that with raw materials that aren't rare, um, that probably don't require questionably ethical methods of mining, um, this is a win, 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 right? We, we get more available energy for us. We get to unblock a lot of the challenges that we've seen with hydrogen. We get to do it using raw materials and don't make as much of an impact on Mm -hmm. the environment. We get to do it in a way that's a lot cheaper, more economical. Um, And I think that's the most important one when it comes to these types of alternative energy adoption. Um, We've seen this definitely in the renewable space. The main deciding factor for people, whether they switch to solar versus their current coal-fired electricity or something like that, there's some extent you can sell people with greenwashing, like say it's better for the environment, or there's some extent you can sell people with convenience saying, oh, you can produce it at your own house. You don't have to rely on the grid. But the number one deciding factor for people in adoption, I would say like 80 to 90% of people is just cost. Is it competitive from a cost perspective? Does it pay itself back in an X number of years? If the payback period is competitive, if the cost versus the alternatives is competitive, I don't see any reason why hydrogen doesn't get adopted as our main energy storage method and our main fuel for things like hydrogen fuel cells. Um, I, I, or in this case, I guess ammonia as the yeah. fuel, and then we help split it into hydrogen that's being used in a fuel cell. Um, for me, that the fact that this is two hundred times cheaper than the current alternative is probably the biggest, most important lever for it out of everything that we've looked at today. I totally agree, and it looks like they identified the main uh, bottleneck for this process. So whatever they've created really addresses the main meat and potatoes of this. Now, uh, in, in terms of the so what, I, re- I do want to point out, um, again, within the same UPenn study, they made a point of saying, hey, 
we got to look at the maximum return on energy invested for all these technologies. So for batteries, right, we have to consider the materials required to actually like make the battery and then where the energy source is. And then at the end, when it's actually getting used, then we can calculate it took X amount of energy to get us here. And then now we're able to retrieve this much of it. And, and I think they also consider like in business terms, you would call it the TAM, like the total available market. Like, okay, so maybe we want to invest a lot of energy and resources into creating lithium ion batteries, but uh oh, we're actually relying on a very limited resource that helps unlock this and make this possible. For sure. The total amount of energy that can be stored in a lithium ion battery is actually quite limited because the resources that we're using for it are quite limited. Correct. Correct. But what I was going to say is in comparison to even liquefied hydrogen, this process of using ammonia as the vector beats it out because it's looking at about a 52% return on energy invested, which in comparison to lithium ion, liquefied hydrogen, pressurized hydrogen gas, it's much superior. So it, again, like you said, it seems to be a win, 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 win. Like there's wins across the board if they're able to crack this. And <laughs> crack then this. again, from, <laughs> <laughs> then again, from a, again, just from a pure molecular perspective, right? Hydrogen and nitrogen are among the most abundant molecules on planet earth. Um, as opposed to using some sort of rare earth metal as the, the reason why we get this done. And then again, apparently the catalyst that's being used in this cracking it's abundant. is apparently an abundant raw material. I can't wait. I think his name's Kevin. Kevin, tell us tell us what this is when you can. We would love to do a follow-up episode. We'd love to interview on here when you can tell us what it is and how Absolutely. it works. Absolutely. And you know what? Uh, quick plug. We have a newsletter. Kevin, one day, whenever you're ready, we'd love to write about what yeah. you're doing within our newsletter. And for folks that are listening, make sure you're signed up so when Kevin drops the sauce, you'll be able to enjoy it with the rest of us. And, and we're, we're just starting, right? We yeah. just started the newsletter, but we love communicating interesting ideas in a way that's easy to understand. That's what this podcast is all about. And we're going to do our darndest to make this the best newsletter you've ever read. So... We like to say now, join now. You can be one of our founding readers. We'll we'll find a way to recognize you for being a founding reader. We'll do our best for sure. Yeah. Quick summary before we wrap up. All right. So in terms of clean energy, um, batteries have just kind of been the way for electric cars, backup power to our houses, et cetera, et cetera. It makes a lot of sense. We can make it. It's got good storage capacity. Um, but hydrogen fuel cells have been so promising, yet... They fail to deliver on that promise because it's just so difficult to transport the liquefied hydrogen to store it because it has to be at such low temperatures, high pressures, very flammable, a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. The last ones that we had in the United States, I'm pretty sure, shut down in California. However, what if we didn't use hydrogen as the means in this current state to be the deliverable? What if we used ammonia as the precursor? Ammonia is stable. We can make it at scale, you know, with relatively little money. And it would allow us to process it at the very end where we need hydrogen's capabilities. Sounds like a great idea. The processes to do this have been very expensive, require a lot of heat. That's not great. Catalysts that can break up the nitrogen from the hydrogen molecules require rare earth materials. That's not good. A researcher at EPFL has cracked the code, come up with a secret sauce that is he's not sharing with anyone just quite yet. He has a patent pending. It should crack the code and make it 200 times less expensive to do this process and potentially unblock the power of hydrogen once and for all for everyone. Nailed it. Try to. I do my best. What can I say? Um, I think that's it. Are we done here? Yeah, I think so. I, I just want to mention, again, appreciate if you made it this far to the end of the episode. We love the people who are rocking with us. Um, if you're somehow here, still here at the end of the episode, we'd appreciate if you could go to wherever you're listening, leave us a review. It's again, it's one of the best ways that you can help other people find us. For sure. Podcasts are incredibly hard to grow, but one of the best ways you can help us to grow is by sharing a review. It lets Apple or Spotify or wherever you're listening, let them know that we're delivering some good stuff and they should recommend it to other people. And if for whatever reason, you're one of the wonderful people who have already left us a review, um, we'd appreciate if you take the link to this episode, copy it, share it with a friend who you think would enjoy it. That's the second best way you can help us to grow. Sounds great. Awesome. Folks, thank you so much for listening. And as always, we'll catch you in the next one. Peace.